Hello and welcome to our third episode of Podify where we've got with us guest speaker today Charles Booth and we're going to be talking about tips on how to pass your EPA. So Charles would you mind introducing yourself please? Sure so um, I'm Charles, Uh, I like to call myself a creative and marketing apprenticeship aficionado. Um, I'm in quite a fortunate position as I'm one of the first coaches at Apprentify from back in the day but also I've been working in apprenticeships for especially apprenticeship standards since they started for you know years i've personally managed to deliver 67 completed apprenticeships and managed to help 200 other people and now i don't really do any coaching anymore just help people getting through their exams and getting through the assessments at the end oh. and then uh, yeah on top of the work i do with apprentify as well i've also got a bit of a, a cheeky side gig as well with first free pa just working with their quality assurance process as well which is quite nice so you get to see generally how the wider apprenticeship process the assessment process works as well nice no that's wicked i didn't realize all that about you myself actually i've just learned something about you as well surprise <laughs> i'll take loads of other stuff and we'll see if it's lies later on we'll see yeah. what... i'll hold you to that now um yeah so today i thought it'd be good to have a bit of a chat with you so our apprentices or any other learners out there you know can get a few tips on their epa the process what it looks like and you know how they can prepare for it if anything so mm-hmm. a good starting point for me um and this is something I'd like to take as well, is do you have any tips on how to effectively study for an EPA? Because I know studying can sometimes be quite difficult. I mean, yeah. I've struggled with it, but if you've got any tips, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, with the with an apprenticeship, it's all about actually doing the work. And I think a lot of it is a, a lot of it's a confidence thing, but you think when you come onto apprenticeship, people have come from this bad program of school and think I've got to read about this, I've got to learn about that and stuff like that. But actually the best thing you can do is say yes to experiences and do things because everybody remembers the things that they've done particularly when you do something new and different and exciting and reflect on that it makes more of an impact and how apprenticeships are are judged are assessed at the end it's actually they're based on your experience and the things that you do so really the best thing to do in terms of studying for the apprenticeship is actually saying yes to it engaging with it um, you know, courses tend to have these extra little things thrown on the side, extra courses on the side, and they might go, oh, why do we need to do that? That's not part of my job. But actually, it adds to that wider breadth, and, you know, you're never in the same company forever. So the more broader experiences, the better. So the best thing to study for it is by, by saying yes and doing the extra, you know, the stranger tasks or the more broader things or, you know, helping out with the other departments or helping on an event and stuff like that. It, the more you say yes at the start, the more that kind of becomes a habit. So when you do get to the assessment at the end of the apprenticeship, actually, you don't necessarily need to read up and revise on things because you've got this wealth of experience that you remember because you were there. So that's probably the best study tip I'd give for you. I love that. That's great. I mean, that resonates with me a lot as well because when I spoke to, because I've, I've not done an apprenticeship, but it is something I wish I had have done because of that on the job learning. But when I did all my qualifications, a lot of the portfolio work was to go out and get your name out there and do like these little tasks. And I remember speaking to like a lot of my friends and people at the time that, that were doing that. And a lot of the time it, their answer was no, and they didn't yeah. want to, they wanted to do other things. So it's, you know, that that's that way of saying yes is really setting yourself in a good stead, isn't yeah. it, to succeed. And you think, and that's probably a good thing as well. You think Every workplace is filled with people who say no to experiences as well, aren't they? And the whole point of apprenticeship isn't just to kind of get a bit of paper and see you've done it as well. You know, it's just career building. It's the start of the rest of your life, isn't it? And so, you know, do the extra things. You know, go down the strange, untrod paths. Like, you know, after my apprenticeship, I I started a publishing business and it worked for a short time as well. Um, But do you know what I mean? And like one of my my apprentices from long ago, he actually, he, he was, his dad gave him the job. And said, right, you go work here. And it just got him to like draw signs on the computer pretty much and stick them to vans. And, you know, he's thinking, oh, it'd be a bit kind of lame. But the guy engaged with it and he said, yes, but he actually, you know, a couple of years later, I'd found out that he'd bought his dad's business and he actually hired one of the other people on his cohort from his college who, I mean, he used to bicker and fight all the time. But, you know, two years later, one apprentice was working for the other one and he owned the company. And you don't get that way by saying no, you only get that way by actually, you know, cracking on and engaging with the process, don't you? Yeah, and you get yourself out there, it's networking, it's, you know, it's all those different benefits with it. And yeah, that's that's a really interesting story, actually. Thanks for sharing that. And so equally then, um, do you find that, you know, have you ever worked with any apprentices or any like learners that make common mistakes when they're preparing like do you have any yeah. examples of that and what that may look like yeah i mean again with um 
with particularly with doing the, the stuff at the end of people's apprenticeships now so i see quite a lot of apprentices when they get to the end of the journey and we do like the mock endpoint assessment with them and um, we've got a bit of a joke internally with our in our department about the two cardinal sins or the two golden rules uh, and so the first bit that people do the first big mistake is whether it's on a portfolio or a project or interviewing or whatever it might be is they say we yeah. and you think it's like a fake British humility thing. Oh, we did this and we did that and we did the other. But if you think about it, if I say, you know, we had the Euros last year and the Lionesses won and we go, oh, yeah, we won, we won, yeah, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And you can just imagine me, I'm a big fat bloke, sat in the <laughs> stall not. saying, yeah, we won at the weekend, woo, and all that sort of stuff. But no, we, no, no, they, they won. Whereas if I said, you know, oh, me and Grace won at the weekend, that says something different. That says, that we actually did it. That's ours. We own it. So I have a bit of a joke about it. So we, it's for weak and wet. You know, yeah. it's not for winning. It's for, you know, it's, it's, so we's the first one, which is a bit kind of gross. Cause as soon as somebody says we, if you're assessing it, it means you got to have a follow up question and say, all right, then, but what did you specifically do in that? And then they feel like they're under pressure, uh, but they've put that, put that pressure on themselves by saying we in the first place. So own it, man. Own your victory. You did it. Own it. Uh, the other one, um, which actually, this has led to fails recently. I've seen some fails. The next one is saying, I don't do X, whatever it might be. Um, the if When somebody, if you ask a question and you say, oh, well, I don't really do blah, 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 this, that, and the other. The first thing that the assessor thinks is, well, hang on, I've just read something about that in a portfolio. Was that all lies? And so you're opening yourself up for more probing and stuff that maybe you didn't want. Um, yeah. That's possibly not the worst thing, but it has. I have seen it lead to fails. Do you know what I mean? I've seen that one be pretty like sinister. But the worst bit about saying I don't or starting a question with I don't is just like the whole thing about saying yes. It gets you into a habit of saying I don't do this. Yeah. And when you're trying to think of what you do do, you can't think of it because what you're thinking about is what you don't do. Yeah. And like, uh, oh, I don't do this. So, oh, no, um, ah, I don't. you get to this like psychological negative cycle of, of being able to do it. So the advice on that one as well I'd give, we'll role play this, why not? Well, the advice <laughs> I give on that is actually instead of opening the sentence with, with I don't, it's actually practice reframing it and saying what you do actually do, just like a politician would on like Newsnight, re- re- reframe it. So, I've got a, I've got a role play. Are you ready for this? I one? love that. We're gonna do for it for sure. You're gonna be my assessor, right? And okay. So, what I want you to do, ask me how I support my customers. Okay. So, Charles, how do you support your customers? Okay. In my role, um, I actually work with the other coaches in my company, and they're my customers rather than the end users who might be the apprentices and the employers. And okay. so the help I, you know, what, what I end up doing is, you know, people come to me and say, oh, Excel's broke. Can you fix this? Oh, I've got this tricky learner, this tricky subject or this weird situation. What can I do to kind of get around that? And so my customer service would be helping them resolve that particular issue. Nice. Now, what I could have said is, well, I don't actually work with the customers. And then I'm like, I yeah. don't know where to go from there. And then that's almost like the end of the conversation then, because you've got nothing to expand. Whereas the difference yeah. of them two answers you've you've told a story and you know you've you've explained how where you've began ends up with the end user of being a customer it's just it's a great way of going about it and i think that's a mindset thing and you should have been a politician you should have been (laughs) yeah you should have been yeah it's a mindset thing and it's that's like an adaption that i think people need to like learn and get on board with and it's it's like a positive way of thinking yeah yeah don't it feel good saying that you know do you know what i do this yeah how many people go through their lives feeling useless at work you know, like just generally as well. And you think, well, do you know what? Actually, I do the, I chose to do the, Yeah. I chose to get up today and do something positive. And, you know, again, it's owning that, isn't it? Never mind this fake, depressing humility nonsense. Nah, own it. No, I think that's that's a great, you can resonate with that in like, <clears throat> sorry, you can resonate with that in like other things as well. Like when you're comparing things with like your friends and your friends are saying, I'm going for a walk or I'm going out this weekend. And then you're thinking, well, I'm not, Yeah. you know? the same thing is well what are you doing instead you know you're at yeah. home you're doing this you're doing that and, you, and you've got to flip your mindset and be positive it's the same as that yeah with studying for your epa and and when you went when you're writing it and putting it all onto paper so that's yeah. really interesting some people call it fomo don't they yeah, but, yeah fomo no. yeah <laughs> put sure. fomo into your epa like yeah, and yeah. flip it <laughs> flip I love FOMO. <laughs> so how important then do you think is hands-on experience in passing your epa do you oh, think that plays an important role definitely i mean i don't have a degree i don't have any education really i was i, I was in the, uh, you know, the, the you know the yeah the, i wasn't in the school system i was in the care system and i kind of like messed around a bit so um for some people they don't have the opportunity of going to university or doing this that and the other they only have the opportunity of learning through experience but this is the difference between an apprenticeship 
and a university course. Actually, the apprenticeship rewards hands-on experience. It rewards getting your hands dirty. In fact, when you think about it, you know, when you work in marketing, you work in the creative industry, you know, how many people come straight out of university and then can just drop into a role and start working? I'd say zero, not a single one. You know, they've got lovely ideas, but actually being able to go and do something and turn it into money, that's in, into a goods and service that someone's going to you know, pay you for at the end, that's a different story. The apprenticeship <coughs> starts you from that position of being valuable. So from day one in the apprenticeship, right, well, we're going to pay you, but we've got to see some results. And so you're actually learning to be value in a very realistic kind of in a way that the universe can't argue with from day one you are earning money you know and think people go oh sales and marketing it ain't nothing they say oh, okay then yeah but how many kind of you know software developers you know have gone out of business because they don't have any customers they might have a software that will cure cancer and change the world they can't sell the thing it's not going to work but actually even in the creative industry in the marketing industry and sales and all those things that hands-on experience is invaluable and it's and so the way the apprenticeship works is it only values the experience you can know all the stuff that you want in your head but ultimately you've got to be able to do the job haven't you and you don't pass till you can do the job and the good thing about apprenticeship is that you can keep going until you can do the job you know it's not like there's an end date and if you don't pass on this day that's it you get this fail like stamped on your forehead for the rest of your life no with the apprenticeship you keep going until you get there I, my apprenticeship was three years and four months long do you know what i mean so it's kind of like I can argue that actually, yeah, you can just keep going until yeah. you pass. And um, so really in this industry, it's, um, yeah, there's no substitute for experience. Another thing as well, when you think about like the sort of job roles, I guess I've got, I did it, I've done a couple of interviews recently with a couple of learners, like at the end of the course and then it's, it's flooding to me head right now as I'm talking. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the things that I've been telling people is when they start is that, so, you know what, I'm not actually interested in we, the company, and I remind them, I'm not interested in we, the company. You could work for the biggest company on planet Earth, you could work for Apple, you could work for NASA, I'm not interested in we, the company. And I'm also not interested in like the software that you use. Oh, I, I use the Adobe Design Suite and does that do this, that, and the other. I'm not actually interested in how the software works. But actually, I am interested on how they contribute to that company yeah. or how they use the software that they've been given on their budget to turn it into the wondrous things that they create. And that actually means more to me as well. There's like, um, I'm, you know, we used to, there used to be a bit of a... When I first started teaching, it was all like kind of graphic design and printing and stuff like that. And the, the myth was, oh, it's got to be industry standard software. It's got to be Photoshop or nothing. And you think, how long does it take to make one image on Photoshop when you've got Canva that will do the same thing for, yeah. you know, much quicker and stuff like that. And actually, it's not about the tool that you use. OK, maybe that's important in some roles. But in real life, it's about how you use the tools that you've been given to you to turn it into something awesome. And so there was a poem about the master's hand, you know, a guitar goes up for auction and it's absolutely knackered and it looks disgusting and no one's bidding for it. And then some bloke with like tight jeans and a big poodle perm comes out, picks up the guitar and plays this awesome kind of, you know, like the symphony of the heavens on it. And all of a sudden everyone starts bidding for the guitar. It was the master's hand that made it sing. And yeah. that's what it is with the apprenticeship. It's that experience, the, the, their individual tips that make it stand out from the generic person who just read the manual and off they went. I love that analogy of the guitar, by the way. That is That just sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that's I brilliant. I didn't make that up. That was a real one. <laughs> my, my old landlord told me that one. <laughs> I'd have taken the credit for that. I'd have run with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Because I think as well, with like hands-on experience, you, you, you're not just learning as well, like, you know, the, the apprenticeship you're doing. You're learning how to interact with people in the workplace. You're learning like all these hidden skills that you don't realize. Like yeah. the amount of friends that I have that have like left university or like gone into jobs and other means. And they've not known how to do the simplest things about how to like structure an email yeah. or and then the very simplest of tasks. And that hands-on experience that aligns with like an apprenticeship to me, I think it gives you all these skills that you don't even realise you're learning. Yeah. So I, th I think it's brilliant, to be honest. Plus, you think on an apprenticeship, you know, there is the... I mean, some people call it a bit of a stigma thing about it, but when you're, when you're an apprenticeship, you've got all the people who are more experienced, and sometimes they treat you treat you a bit like dirt, give you a slap around, say, no, do that right. But the thing is, after that, you do that right. Yeah. Whereas some people might have, like, you know, the whole silver spoon experience, and they'll come in, and they'll never get corrected, and they'll always be bad, and they'll never learn because they're on this high tower where, no, you know, they'll never get there sometimes you know like there's something about like steel being like made in the fire and there's sometimes on an apprenticeship it's a hard job yeah um but you know you get you, you it refines the bad habits out of you and it makes you better and all yeah. that sort of stuff as well yeah i love it though no that's that's actually really good advice thank you for that i mean talking on that as well um on more on like the epa side of things 
how can apprentices ensure they're meeting the required standards during their on-the-job training? So whilst they're actually in the yeah. workforce and you know they're getting that hands-on experience, how can they ensure they're meeting the required standards? Yeah, this one, I'm going to go back to the idea of like being open to learning. I think that's probably the first bit because they do give you at the start of every course, they give you the standard, they tell you what it's got to be. And I have had conversations with some apprentices where they looked at that and gone, oh, why am I ever going to need to do that? Why am I ever going to need to do that? Why am I ever going to need to do that? And it's like sabotage, self-sabotage from day one. Yeah. And so actually, do you know what? You know, you've got that standard, but be open to it, apprehend it, you know, own it and like work for, you know, actually, you know, don't take it for granted. See it for what it is. There's a reason it's there, you know, like clever people have worked on these standards for a long time to get them where they are, to help us in the here and now. But actually, it's not just about the here and now as well. So I also, see, I also try and encourage people to see it from the point of view of one day they're going to be somebody else's manager. They're going to be someone else's boss. It could be their company. Do you know what I mean? They're going to be the top dog. Yeah. And they're going to need to guide others. And so when it comes to, like, you know, you see the standard, you see the task, what you're being given to do, treat it as if, well, if I was the boss, well, try and see it from if I was the boss, is what I'm doing good enough that I could show somebody else or that I could hold somebody else to account? And it's a good way of kind of like self-regulating, um, you know, how do you know if you're any good enough? Well, actually, if you can tell somebody else how to do it with authority without kind of, you know, um, faking it or what have you, that's pretty, that's pretty solid evidence that actually you're, you've, you've hit that standard. And often, oftentimes the standard isn't as, you know, high and unreachable as people first think it is when they first start the job. You know, you look, look back after six months and you think, do you know what, I can do 80% of this course yeah. at the back of my hand, you know, pretty quickly. And so it's just apprehending that and then acknowledging that perhaps the other ones that maybe don't do all the time, how can I get to that level with those? How can I beat my own record at one thing with this thing that I don't do so often and stuff like that? And then I also think as well, it's with, with, with these kind of individual like standards and individual kind of tasks, um, it's to try and teach other, just try and get into a, a practice of teaching other people how to do it. Um, yeah, that's a great bit of advice. Like, uh, you know, me and my wife, uh, I mean, my wife's a counsellor, like she's a, a studying counsellor, uh, and, uh, you know, I've owned like a, you know, a, a business in a former life and stuff like that. And we talk to each other about this and we try and teach each other, each, our, our, we're completely incompatible as human beings, but we try and teach each other, like, our experience. She tries to teach me how to cook and bake and I fail at it. She tries to teach me how to be a better <laughs> person as a counsellor, which I fail at as well. And then I try and teach her, you know, how to, you know, look after her money and all those things. And she fails at that. So, we, you know, but the fact that we're trying to teach it to each other, it kind of helps us solidify what we know yeah and so you know you engage with the task you know engage you know engage with all parts of the task all parts of the program but then try and get to a place where do you know what you feel comfortable sharing that with somebody else yeah I feel like when you get to that stage as well I feel like you know if you can if you can sit down and talk to someone else about it like you said you, you almost get that confidence and reinsurance back in yourself because yeah. you, you know if you if you can say it to someone else it's like that self What's the word? Yeah. Like, Affirmation. Affirmate. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've had, like you, you given yourself that positive energy and stuff to know that you, you are capable of doing this, and that will then transfer into other skills because yeah. you'll know you'll get to that. So I think that's a really good piece of advice. I yeah. love that. Thank it's all, you. It's all a confidence thing, isn't it? This yeah. probably applies to every part of life, doesn't it? There's something yeah. about you know, like you can work on confidence. You can develop confidence. You can. You just have to choose to develop confidence, and or choose to do something that will develop your confidence or something like that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. But for me, when I was stud studying for exams, um, obviously I didn't do an apprenticeship, but I had to study for like 10 point exams for like my university and stuff like that. I really struggled to manage like my workload. So yeah. that, that was something that I really struggled with. Um, and during an apprenticeship, obviously you get that off the job training hours, like designated to your apprenticeship. Yeah. Do you have any tips on like when you're preparing for EPA, how you can manage workload in the professional environment um, whilst you're studying and, yeah. and learning and stuff like that. Do you have any tips on how to manage that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, uh, this is my, my joke about I always repeat myself and say the same sort of thing. Um, <laughs> everyone struggles this for the rest of their life until the end of time as well, don't they? So it's kind of a nice thing. But I think the best thing, particularly with apprenticeship, well, I have this threat that I used to give to apprentices. If they hadn't done any work one month, I'd work out, I'd do the maths with them and work out how many tasks they got to do the next month. And then I'd skip it forward three more months. And imagine if you didn't do it for another three months, this is how much work you got to do at the end. And usually I try and put a bit of, you know, a bit of the fear of God in them, how much work they've got to do. <laughs> it doesn't actually work most of the time, but it's a nice trick. And yeah, every now and then you'll get one or two people who go with it. But the, the advice I would give is, you know, there's, it, it's to start right with it. 
And so when you start the apprenticeship, I know it's kind of, well, what if you're halfway through? Do you know what's never too late to start? You know, you could be in like month nine in the apprenticeship or month 13 in the apprenticeship. You know, just start right now. Um, but if you start right, particularly at the start of the apprenticeship, you've got more time at the start. You're not as responsible or as busy at the start. Yeah. You've got that time. Fill it with as much good stuff as you can. You know, you you know, get ahead of a task. Do something early. Do, do you know what I mean? Choose one thing that goes above and beyond at the start and, and, and get ahead. You've always got more time at the start, whereas most people, most apprentices will all kind of vouch for this as well. They'll get to, you know, like month nine or something like that, and all of a sudden this apprenticeship work's starting to have to take a bit of a back seat because that's so much actual work to yeah. do. All of a sudden they've realised they've got good at the job and they're generating leads and they're bringing the money in and they're doing a successful thing, building something wonderful and the, the boss wants them, the company wants them to be doing this wonderful thing that makes them all this money, not studying an apprenticeship. So use that time at the start so when you get to the end, all you have to do is show off yeah. the talents that you've got later on. I also think this, I mean, I say that, that on a macro level across an apprenticeship, but it applies to days as well. Yeah. And um, and my, my proof of this is if I look at my own weekends, you know, when you start the day right, which on the weekends I don't, um, <laughs> but when you start the day right, actually, you know, if, if I take my children, if I take Henry to football on a Saturday and it's in the middle of nowhere and I have to get up at like half past seven and we do football and we're back and, and, and they've won, that's it, the day started right then. I'll do tons of stuff the rest of the day. The car will be filled. We'll do a tip run. I'll make a pizza. We'll, you know, like blow something up in the garden and build something awesome. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Set fireworks off and ruin the neighbourhood. We'll have a wonderful day if I start it right. So in, in the workplace, um, you can start the day right as well. So one of my, if I've got a busy day ahead and I've got like a load of silly tasks that I need to focus on and stuff like that, or, you know, something that's, a, you know, a grind that I don't really want to do. Um, one of my kind of golden rules for myself is, right, this day I've got to eat the frog. I'm not going to look at my emails till lunch. It's a weird habit. When I don't look at my emails, that means I also don't look at Microsoft Teams. I don't read my messages. I don't go on WhatsApp or anything like that. I don't look at my messages until lunch. And it's what I've done. I've probably... For me personally, I've deleted the single biggest distraction that's going to get me. Yeah. And so when it comes to like things like studying, particularly when you've got something difficult, if you can find the thing that's your distraction, and for me, as you can tell, it is talking. Um, <laughs> so if I can kind of uh, you know reduce the impact of my talking on the day, all of a sudden I'll be very productive. And also I'm, I'm more productive in the morning. I get to two o'clock and that's it, my brain shuts down. So if I don't look at my emails, if I give myself a promise, I'm not going to look at my emails, look at my messages till 12, that gives me a good solid you know, like three, four hours of, you know, hard graft uh, and a successful graft that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. And it take, maybe it takes a little bit of discipline. But to be honest, I, I, you know, once a week I'll try, you know, I'll, I'll put all my hard jobs on one day and I'll give myself one day where I'll torment myself with no messages and no emails. Funny enough, 20% off the job, one day a week. But I'll give myself that one day to, you know, lump all of that torture together in okay. one. And boom, <clears throat> really good use of the time, really happy successful day i'll get to like 12 o'clock and i'll go on teams i'll go onto our team chat and be like hey guys i've done all this cool stuff <laughs> check out the spreadsheet i made Woo. i'll have to look out for their messages and i'll know <laughs> yeah, yeah that was the one day he was productive yeah, yeah i'll yeah. learn not to message you before 12 now <laughs> if Madness. i need anything <laughs> i love that no but that is that is exactly it isn't it i mean when you mentioned that about the weekends that is just me to a t like if one weekend i'm feeling lazy and i decide not to do something that's me done for the day yeah so it is it's getting up going like going out getting on a walk on a weekend and in the workplace it's like you say setting setting that time apart i mean for me like how i manage workload and this doesn't work for everyone is i like set myself like time throughout a day to get certain activities done yeah so i know within that time you know yeah. I'm, I'm getting them tasks and like I order things in like a list of priority to high. Yeah, um, that's a good way of reminding it as well. Yeah, you know, I forget loads of stuff. And one thing, like every now and then, like my colleague Sam will put stuff in my calendar, and all of a sudden, stuff that I would have absolutely forgotten, it gets done because yeah. it's in the calendar. And it's, you know about it. Yeah. You get a notification, like you know yeah. you've got to do it. So if you put it in your calendar, there's no excuses. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> why I always forget putting it in my calendar. But it is a belt. When other people do it for me, yeah, that's a belting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you need somebody who's like really super organised. You don't need that because you have to look after yourself. But yeah. If you had somebody else who like put stuff in your calendar, and says, "Yeah, Charles, you've got this to do. It's got to be in by this time." You'll actually do it then. Right? Yeah. That's a cracking move, isn't it? I know. It helps me. But yeah, so I, I can imagine, you know, because you were talking about when, when they get like further down the process and they get nine months in, they're more engrossed in their job, they've got more responsibility and like you say, they're getting in leads and stuff, that it gets to that stage where your apprenticeship does take the back burner a little bit and it mm. becomes less of a priority. So if you were an apprentice 
and you know you, you didn't have the confidence to maybe reach out to your supervisor or your manager and say look I need to take my day I need to take my hours um, I'm going to set some time aside you know some people might struggle with that so how would you yeah. advise that they go about that yeah it's a tough one I think I mean I, I, I feel quite comfortable in you know saying I'm literally deliberately ignoring people for a day and like kind of making the first move what I find that you know particularly you turn your phone off and you don't respond to people and what have you so over time people do uh, like respect that I remember reading essentialism and the guy was talking about how he goes monk mode and and people learn to just adapt around him if you're brave I'd say yeah go monk mode and say right well this has happened no matter what I'm going to ignore everyone else for today I'm not going to engage at all because I've got a job to do I'm going to yeah. put it in my calendar so everyone can say super busy today anyone disturbing me will be punished you could even put that in your calendar there's no rules right you can do whatever you want um, you know put that in your calendar so if you were super brave maybe that's the move it is harder when the rest of when you you know when the when, when you know if it's the boss or the manager or the company that's saying you can't do this um, I think it's really easy to get angry and go, well, you're not letting me do this, so I'm not going to engage and stuff like that. Well, that's probably quite harmful. And sometimes, you know, nobody likes to do it, but you've got to have that honest conversation with somebody and say, you know, look, boss, I want this course. I need this. This is important to me. And, you know, getting this through is going to make me feel better and all this sort of stuff. And have, having that conversation from my point of view, not you're not letting me do this. But I need to do this and have yeah. that personal conversation. But the other thing, you're not alone with this. Every apprentice has got a coach. And any coach worth his worth their metal, worth the you know, the pennies that they pay him at the end of the month will stand up for that learner and will accompany that learner in to have those meetings. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to turn into a falling out, you know, because usually it's just a case of you know, we assume that you know a boss just knows. They don't just know. They want the best for everybody usually yeah, and sometimes yeah, yeah. you forget. And so sometimes <clears> just having, you know, if you're not comfortable with yourself, you've got that coach with you. You know, ask the coach to say, do you know what? You know, like, you know, Charles here really needs to do this course. You know, it's really important to them that they do that course. And the coach, it's easy for a coach to say to a boss, what have you, usually the boss is younger than they are, but it's easy for a coach to say, look, this is important to them. This is valuable to them. You know, please, you know, respect that and let them do that course and you know and and most coaches will engage with that a lot of coaches will take a sadistic delight in telling their boss to let their learner do the work for them because <laughs> you know usually it's the coach who's stressing out that they haven't done the work because the coach has got numbers to hit as well yeah and so like the coach is quite happy to do but i'd say don't be you know that's what the coach is there for if you need that help if you're not confident about talking to them yourself or you're not sure usually it's just because they don't know no one's there's very rarely any malice no one's out to get you or anything like that sometimes it's just a case that they don't know and it just needs a nice honest way of bringing it up and i'll say you know always from the first person this is important to me i really need to do this yeah and if you set the day aside and say like i'm having you know next tuesday is my day for apprenticeship work i really need to do this next tuesday um so you know i'm i, I am i'm going to tell you as a few of my boss i am going to ignore you this day um, but anything you need, I'll sort it out the day after yeah. or something like that. But have the conversation. And just, you know, don't think anyone's out to get you because they're usually not. It's nice that with Apprentify that the apprentices have that support as well, that they, you know, they, they can fall back on a development coach yeah. and go to them for that advice. I mean, one thing I've always done is if I'm in a struggle, like a struggle like that, is I've always wrote down, I've gone back to the basics and wrote down my whys, like why have I done this apprenticeship? What have I wanted to achieve? Like I've, I've wrote all that down and then, if you then wanted to speak to your manager, explain that and always go back to the very beginning and how you felt month one of your apprenticeship, yeah. for example, or month one of doing like your course and whatever you're doing and it, and explain it back from then. So, you, so you've got a reason as to why you're having that conversation. Yeah. Um, that's like one thing that's always helped me anyway. But yeah. no, that's really helpful. Central motivation, isn't it? Like, exactly. What do you actually want? Yeah, it seems cringy sometimes, but it, it works. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, the reason why some people are living unhappiness is because they don't look at what they actually want for exactly. their life, don't they? So yeah. <clears throat> exactly. No, it makes perfect sense. And equally, whilst we're talking about like management and supervisors, because there's a lot of benefit to working with them as well. Like you know, you learn a lot from them. You can bounce ideas. They're there to support yeah. you, and it's and it's really helpful. So, how would you advise like apprentices to effectively communicate with like their managers or their supervisors or any other trade professionals yeah. that, are, that are helping them to help them gain knowledge and build their skills to help towards their EPA? Yeah, I mean this this is an important thing. You know, like 
you, you've got to con- you have got to connect with everybody. And I think you know before you get to the managers, one of the first things I try and get the learners doing, like the very first classroom session, they're in a cohort of other people. Yeah. Connect with those people. They're all valuable people working in the same industry, but usually have different kind of like perspectives on the same thing, and they've got this like wealth of experience that you can draw on. But also, that's a powerhouse by itself. You know, you connect with a cohort of individuals who, you know, you, you know, you yourself do social media and stuff like that. Somebody posts something on social media, you know, particularly something like LinkedIn. The biggest boost on LinkedIn is when somebody seemingly unconnected comments on your post. Yeah. And on an apprenticeship cohort, you've got all these people who are seemingly unconnected. LinkedIn doesn't know you're on the same class. They comment on the post. Boom, your post goes up to super engagement mode in the first hour. So you can, it's like a bit of a pod, isn't it? But you know, so connecting with your cohort has a bit of a power to it as well. When you've got that cohort and you've got the experience of your other cohort, it's it kind of equips you on how else you can deal with your supervisors and people in your workplace. Yeah. Because you've got their experience of how they deal with theirs and you'll have different types of managers with different types of styles. And so having that kind of relationship where you can talk to those others in your cohort on an equal level helps you talk with other people who are perhaps on a different level, like higher or lower, etc. Um, so that's one kind of useful thing. Another thing that's, that I think is quite important, particularly based around supervisors, one thing I, I find with a lot of apprentices, probably more the younger ones who are, say, you know, under 20 or something like that, the ones who haven't really worked in a full-time professional environment before, there's a lot of programming that goes on in school where children are taught to respect the teacher and this professional distance between, you know, student and teacher emerges where people actually are a bit nervous about talking yeah. to the teacher and sometimes put them on a pedestal or think they're out to get them or think that they're, you know, high and mighty, something like that. There's a bit of distance about it. And so, you know, there is something to be said about trying to recognise that programme and overcome that programme. And, you know, in an apprenticeship, the chances are you'll get some feedback that maybe you won't like. It might sound like that was rubbish, do it again, when you've translated in your head. But what supervisors generally mean, what most companies mean, they want the best. Every boss, every supervisor, they want the best for their company, their team and their life. They want an easy life. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, when they give you feedback, it's kind of recognising, you know, they're not trying to criticise you as a teacher might, um, if you've had a bad experience at school. Um, they're not trying to criticise you not out to get you, but actually they want the best for you. And so taking that time to kind of recognise your own programme and recognising that actually do want the best for you will help you treat them more like they're an equal person with the same struggles and same thoughts and same imposter syndromes that you might have as well. Yeah. And then when you've kind of got that, it helps you when you can when you can talk to people like teachers sorry, teachers, <laughs> when you can talk to people like bosses and supervisors in that way and you feel comfortable talking to others where you haven't got them on that weird pedestal like there's something other than you. That helps you talk with other groups, other professionals. It helps you to kind of connect with, you know, when you come to look for another job, when you come to, you know, start your own company or find new sales or, you know, go hunting for your own prospects, etc. It helps you. It helps you with that because you've got a more level playing field of yeah. how people are in your own mind. And so from that, after that, I'd say it's a case of, you know, you know, you can work on that, you know, work on treating people up that way. So connect with other groups, connect with other people who might look older or, you know, wear a suit or dress differently or whatever it might be. You know, connect with those other people. You know, diversity is good for the soul, right? Um, so connect with those people and listen to them. Uh, I would say when you do go connecting with lots of other people and supervisors, there's also you know, make sure that your own kind of nonsense detector in your own mind is operating. And like, if you, you know, talk to somebody, if they've got something good to say, absorb that, take it in. But also recognise that some people are just as clueless as I am. And so, yeah. you know, let, you know, <laughs> feel free to kind of judge it by its own merit. And if it doesn't work for you, discount yeah. it and move on. And, you know, don't think that you're missing out on something just because you don't understand it. That's just their tip. Yeah, that makes sense. I think networking is so important. Like, especially if like you're doing an apprenticeship in like marketing or sales or all of these like more hands-on roles. Networking yeah. is very important because it's it's the best way of learning. It's the best way of getting your name out there. Like oh, sure. figuring out new things. I mean, they have like um, like di- digital marketing expos and stuff that you can go to and network, and you meet hundreds of different you know trade yeah. professionals and that. So there's also those network events, but like like you say, LinkedIn. Yeah. Is, is one of the best tools for that for networking connecting with people hearing yeah. their stories and sharing and stuff so yeah it's, it's a hidden tool but it's i think you know going to, going to stuff in person as well i know we've had a couple of years with well he hasn't done it but I, I i remember meeting i remember meeting the inventor of a digital inkjet printer oh that's cool i met the inventor of a machine that people take the guy who invented it i met him um, name's Benny Lander. It wasn't all of them, but it was like this inkjet thing. And he's invent. I only met him because he's invented a new one. 
um, and it's like, wow, the coolest thing. And I met this other guy who invented sonic cleaning for, no you know, way. like the things where you're like a little water bath and it shakes all the stuff off it. And but these are the things you go to these like expos and you think, oh, you didn't meet the event there. But no, that's where they are. That's yeah. where, you know, you want to meet the authority on a subject. That's where they'll be. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Go to it. Like if it means a flight to Germany for a day, do it. Go for it. You I know. know. Yeah. It's such a good experience. And not being funny, that is a cool, that's a cool like little bragging thing, isn't it? Yeah. That you've met them people because, you know, it's not often you meet an inventor of something, you know, that yeah. you, you see everywhere you go and you see people using every day. Well, maybe it is. I mean, we forget we work in, a, you know, when you think about the, you know, the, the, the uh, industrial parks we'll work on. Yeah. You know, how many dozens of like, you know, app developers and things that, you know, they change the world, they're just around. We just don't know they're there. Because you're not talking to them yeah. to find out. You go to an event, all of a sudden you realise that on your doorstep, you know, there are inventors of, yeah. you know, oh, I've got loads of stories of, of people who have discovered locally who've done like wild things that you never even know they're there. You know, I've got an app on my phone that's like a school app that um, like all the primary schools use and it was made locally. And I'm like, and I've met the guy and he just looks like he's, he's a normal guy. And yeah. he's like, I use this to talk to the teachers at the, at the primary school. It's, yeah, it's real. And they're all right there. So any excuse to, yeah, use those excuses to meet the local geniuses because there's more of them out there than we think. And you even realise, no, you, you're you 100% right. Um, on like, like flipping that back to EPA then, because that was really interesting. <laughs> um, can you share an experience with an apprentice you've worked with or know of? Um who has successfully passed their EPA and how they got there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot, yeah. Um, but, so there are a couple of themes of of, of people I work with. So I've got, I'm going to give you from two different angles. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you here one one gentleman who didn't do very, very well. Um, they, they knew the job. Uh, they were, to be fair, they were dead good. They were in like a, a design role, a content production role. They were, they were, you know, they knew the job. They did pretty, you know, well at work. Um, they came with their own emotional baggage. I'll let you translate that how you will. Um, <laughs> but they, um, they were a bit difficult to work with. And they actually, the first time round, they failed their EPA. They, they got through. They did the observation, and it didn't go well. They, it failed. It was traumatic. It was, you know, and it was really, ups it was upsetting for them. It was upsetting for me and knowing the person, you know, you get, get blamed for it, don't you? See the coach, oh, you you didn't tell me this. And actually you were like, well, we did tell you the, um, and there was a bit of complacency about it and stuff like that. And it was just because he thought, well, I'll, do, I'll just wing it on the day. Uh, yeah. And, and, but the, the over, the overall sentiment after all this, after you cut through the fact that it didn't go well was, um, you know, I wish I'd prepared. You know, they, yeah, it's too late after it's happened. I wish I prepared. And so they, I mean, they did retake it. They did get to go through and, re and have the second stab at it. So they did, you know, in the end, they did pass it and all that. Um, but yeah, it was that the initial sentiment of, oh, I didn't prepare. I should have prepared. And when they looked back, it would have been so easy to spend. Because when we prepared for the real thing the second time around, it was 45 minutes of our time. We went through everything together. We ticked off everything. It was yeah. the best job we could have ever done. And it was looking back and thinking, that it was a 45 minute meeting we could have done that before and you could have and passed think, first time yeah and you think oh the regrets and all it would have been was just go right let's look at the things i've got to do and just make sure i've got something that covers all that and that would have been it uh, and so it should have prepared weirdly the most common feedback i get because we do like mark endpoint assessments and lots of activities around epa preparation and stuff like that, uh, the, the feedback we usually get after they finish their epa is um that uh, the mock epa was worse do you know what I mean? To get to I the suppose real that's assessment. good though, because oh, yeah. it, because it, it prepares them for the worst, doesn't it? Yeah, so yeah. I suppose that's a good thing. And they and they do <laughs> they do generally say, oh, I'm glad I did this. We get particularly like interview things and stuff like that. I mean, most of our interviews go really, really well, and that's because all of our coaches generally they do interview questions and they try and come out from off the wall and all that sort of stuff. So we do a lot of practice for interviews, so they all say, oh, I'm glad I did actually do the preparation. You know, sometimes they hate it at the time, and they do like they'll tell you it's traumatic at the time, but at the end they do say, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that I did the prep. And I had, you know, another girl a couple of years ago who was doing quite a difficult course and they had to, it, was, it wasn't a hard job but the company was going through trouble so they were, you know, worried in the company and so we had a, a similar thing where they did a, a mark endpoint assessment first and it went pretty badly and it you know, it's quite a knock to the confidence and stuff like that. And um and so we said, Well, do you know what? We're gonna do the mark endpoint assessment again. We're not gonna do it straight away. What we'll do is, you know, so me and this girl, we arranged to have another bit of an interview together and we did like a little one and then we did a slightly bigger one and, and we just kind of went through the process of, of just like working out how you'd answer awkward yeah. questions and just, you know, not let the 
you know, some you know sometimes that the confidence thing's a real thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. the, the anxiety can get to you. But you know, how can we we practiced overcoming the exact anxiety in a little way? And then they got through the thing, and like this, this girl, the endpoint assessment, the, the the feedback she got was, it was almost you know eye watering. Oh, um, like lovely. you know, it was this learner was so well prepared. Um, there were so many things in there, and it's like particularly if you're worried about it, particularly if you're anxious about it, when you get to that feedback at the end of it, you know the the the, the endpoint assess will tell you what you've done well. Yeah. Um, the there's a bit of a, a general experience that all apprentices seem to go through. So they all have this like traumatic build up because it's like, oh, what's it going to be? And like they've had the mock EPA and it'll be with me and it'll be an awful. And they'll have all this feedback from the coach and we'll make sure you remember this. And then yeah. they go to the endpoint assessment, you're like, oh, that's going to be awful. And they worry. And then they do the endpoint assessment. And then an hour or two later, they're like, oh, was that it? It's all over. That wasn't so bad. And then they have a couple of weeks where they're like, oh, maybe it was bad. Oh no! Yeah. And they're writing the nails again, and like, what happened? What happened? Oh, I'm gonna, it's gonna fail. I'm gonna fail. And then they get the result through, and it says distinction. You know, really well done. And then they look at the feedback and look back, and they go, of course it was good. Why? Because I know the job. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? I know the job, and so I made a mantra on this one because, like, this it's a confidence thing again, isn't it? Yeah. And it's so, it's so you're ready for it. I'm gonna give you this one. So it's you, and this counts for you, this counts for you, Grace. You are good at your job. You know you are because you made it this far and now you're going to show somebody else that you're good at your job and they're going to agree with you. Why? Because you are good at your job. You know you are because you made it this far and now you're going to show someone else that you're good at your job. And you can go on and out forever and ever and yeah, ever with this nonsense. I love that. But, I feel but empowered. <laughs> yeah, man, I want to stand up and punch the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, you know, yeah, it's legit. And, and yeah, this is the thing. Most people, they go for the endpoint assessment and it's like they have all this worry and they get to the end. It's just like a driving test. You get to the end, you're like, oh. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. yeah. Now what? Oh, I guess I'll go and like live the rest of my life because ultimately that was a piece of paper. And it was just a step on the journey to being a better you know, human being, a better person in your career, a, you know, a conqueror of worlds or whatever it is you're doing, isn't it? Exactly. I think the, the two key points there, and this has been like reoccurring throughout the whole podcast, is confidence and like positivity as well like yeah, and being and preparing so like you make, make if you're prepared you you build that confidence and you're positive yeah to me that's like being the key message throughout the whole of this podcast that you should get there yeah. with like the help and support of everyone around you you should get there yeah man acknowledging it yeah you just need you to know, acknowledge it yeah acknowledge that it's all right I'm, I'm feeling empowered now, so yeah, yeah. I'm hoping the listeners do too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wake up every now and then and feel, I, go, I tell myself, I'm really well fed. Yeah. Do you know what? Like 100, 200 <clears throat> years ago, maybe my ancestors couldn't have said that, could they? No. Yeah. Things aren't that bad, are they? No, they're not. No, I love that. And I think this is a good little question to end up on because yeah, yeah. everyone loves a little free being a little free tool. So have you got any recommendations for resources or tools that you recommend to apprentices to use for preparing for their EPA? Yeah, my right. So I wrote a list. Oh, you bro, to, to even got, better. We got a shopping list. Everyone right. get a pen and paper ready. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> can I read my own writing? Um, okay, so number one thing, you said this earlier, you need the calendar, you know, plan your time. Yeah. You know when it's coming, you know the date of it, you know. So if you know that this thing's at 10 o'clock on, you know, Monday, don't plan a job in at nine o'clock on Monday just beforehand. You know, use that time, acknowledge the time. Don't give yourself extra stress you don't need, man. Yeah. You know, yeah, plan your time. And, you know, if, if it's in the afternoon and you've got a morning free and someone's looking at your calendar going, oh, I wonder if I can give a little, a little job to them. <laughs> no, mate, block it out. Say, I've got very important stuff to do this morning. Lie, cheat and steal if you have to, but plan that time. Use that time. Yeah. You know, don't, you know, go out on the lash the night before and expect it'll be like rosy. You know, like, look after yourself, man. Do... Do crosswords or something. Get yourself in the zone with it. Love that. Um, I'd also say, you know, so yeah, tool number one, the calendar, plan the time. Tool number two, you've got a coach. You know, one of the things we found um, like quite early on, uh, we found a massive difference in the results um, when a uh, when an apprentice bagged their coach like a day or two before their endpoint assessment and just had like a last minute catch up and talked them through the plans that they got for their endpoint assessment. We saw a jump we saw a, 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 an actual measurable jump in EPA results uh, to the point where it sort of became mandatory. You know, you've got a really weaselly way out of it. Yeah, book that time with your coach. Use the coach. Like, if you've missed something, they'll tell you. They, yeah. They're looking at it all day, every day. They'll tell you. Um, you know, so you've got your coach. I'd also say practice with other people. You know, like I run most of my ideas or like whatever comes in the bed, I run past my wife and she'll kind of, you know, 
try and challenge me a little bit if she gets it and stuff like that. But she'll be positive if I don't. And you know, people are always a bit embarrassed about, who oh, can I um can I give you a question to ask me and I'll try and answer it. People are embarrassed the first time, but once you got into a habit of it, you know, it'll be fine. Yeah. Just, you know, practice with other people. Um I suppose the next thing, you know, you've got your endpoint assessment. Okay, so we've done the people side of it. You get a lot of resources from most endpoint assessors in terms of to prepare for it. So if you get an observation, they'll give you a list of things you need to prepare for your observation. Oh amazing. You know, plan it out. You know, they'll say what they want to see. You plan something that you can show for all those things. It might be that you've got like twenty five things they want to see. But if you get more than 20, you've got a distinction. So plan 21. Plan what you want them to see. You know, like look at your job and plan it all in. You know, job done. Same with projects. Um, they, if, they, if they're giving you a project to do, like a case study to do, they give you a list of what they want. So don't overcomplicate it. Just plan. Put yeah. in your plan how you're going to cover all these things. With projects, if it's written as well, I like to write the headings out. You know, like with blogs and stuff like that, you'd write the heading out for the project. And then when I, if I know what the headings are, I know what to put in my project a bit later on. And, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So use the stuff you've got. I also found that with like interviews, usually most endpoint assessors, they'll give you a mapping document of all the criteria they're looking for. And you know, and they'll tell you, oh, where have you put it in your portfolio? Or where have you put it in your project? And stuff like that. Use those documents, because the chances are, when you come to the live endpoint assessment with an actual human being, they're going to follow that order. So you can have that mapping document in front of you, get a pen and paper an hour before and just write down notes of how you're going to answer each question. If they're going to ask you a question or something, here's how I'm going to answer that. And you can write bullet points yeah. for each kind of question on the mapping document, you know, and it'll follow the time frame and everything. You know, you've got the tools, you know, it's just acknowledging that they're there. It was like the whole thing, you know, when you used to do a maths exam and it said you can take a dictionary into the exam with you. And you're always like, well, why would you take a dictionary into a maths exam? And that's because when you forget what mean and median and mode mean, you can open up the dictionary and look it up and answer the question. So all you're doing is you're using the tools cleverly. There you go, maths exam tip 101. You've yeah. just thrown me back to school with mean, median and mode. That has taken I me I like... I started shaking there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've just given me flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awkward. <clears throat> but yeah, so yeah, you've got the tools, use it. Uh, I think with the... And then because you've, you've got the live assessment, um, again, coming down to practice, practice slowing down before a question. I know it's a bit rich coming from me, talks a million miles an hour. Um, but practice slowing down before a question, you know, like... You know, if when you're in a rush to answer the question, you ramble around and round and round in circles before mm -hmm. you get to it, and sometimes you don't actually say the thing you wanted to say. But if you can pause, I like to do this, so I put my hands together like a diamond shape. Uh, but if you pause, or maybe even repeat the question back, or say, okay, or certainly, a nice long word, absolutely, makes you sound posh and important. It does. Uh, <laughs> but then it gives you that kind of breathing space to think of the right answer. So one, practice slowing down. And the other thing is the, there's something called the STAR method that we use quite a lot. Um, STAR method is basically when you answer a question, you don't just give them an answer, you give them an example, you give them a situation. So STAR, situation, task, action, and result. So I compare it to a dragon slaying story. So whatever you're going to do, you're going to give them a story about it. Can I give them a dragon slaying story? You can yeah. Ed edit this out when it no, turns I out. No, I want to hear the story. Oh, right. <laughs> you've so, mentioned it now. <laughs> so think about these. So you've got four things, the situation, the task, the action, and the result. Okay, so once upon a time in a far off land, there was this beautiful village that was beset by a dragon. It'd fly in, it'd eat the cattle, it would burn down the villages, right. you know, it would steal the children and it'd steal all the gold and like take it off to its cave in the mountains. Somebody needed to stand up and take on the dragon. So I put on my armour, I got on my white horse and I sharpened my sword and I went off on an epic quest across hills and fields, climbing mountains through swamps, through treacherous icy tundras and through scorching hot deserts and I climbed the mountain of the dragon and when I entered its cave I drew my sword and I did battle and I stabbed <laughs> it in its heart and I chucked off its head and I carried the head victoriously back to the town and the villagers were liberated they were set free forevermore the scourge of the dragon was gone and the earth was robbed of this majestic and beautiful creature because this is actually a story about how human beings are wiping the out every you know large creature on earth it's quite a sad story actually but could you see the star method could you see the situation the task the action and the result i could see it and i think you're in the wrong job charles i think you yeah. need to go into storytelling that was yeah, brilliant yeah. <laughs> yeah i do a cracking medusa story with the kids it scares them to sleep it's great <laughs> maybe we'll keep that one for next time yeah there we have it. I want to do a method as well. Like, like my last one, my, my, this I should have ended with this dragon slaying story, but my last one as well. This is one that um, quite a lot of some of the you know the older, more wiser coaches use, and so it must work because they got like in fact the two coaches have got the best results at Apprentify distinction wise. Their their method is they set up a playlist, 
they have a Spotify chill out playlist. Oh, I say, love that. Yeah, before your endpoint assessment, chill, just chill. They give them some music. They give them like a chill out playlist. They give them the thing to get in the zone, like give them a crossword or a Sudoku or something to do and just chill. I love that. And then when you get into the get into the meeting, you're like, yeah, man. I'm zen. You know, yeah. There's, the anxiety is dead. Yeah. Maybe you've done a couple of crosswords. You're used to dealing with problems or whatever it is, but you're in the mood. You're in the mood to conquer the endpoint assessment. And it's over before you know it. Yeah, because there's no point wasting that time before your EPA panicking, going around in circles. If you're doing something yeah. to clear your mind, it's great. I need I need that Spotify playlist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I need to chill, so if you've got one, you'll need to send it to I, me. <laughs> I remember All Saints Pure Shores is on it. That's the one I remember, just because I remember when that came out. But yeah, how about that? I love that. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And honestly, Charles, you've been great today. You've given some fantastic tips, which I'm sure all the learners will utilise, run away with and use, I hope anyway, because it's a great tip to have. Have you got anything else to add that you wanted to mention before we finish up? That's a risky question. You can't ask me that. Oh, dear. I haven't. No, no, you're all right. No, do you know what? It's been a devotional experience. Thank you very much for having me. No, no problem at all. And thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. So, yeah, that finished up today's episode of Podify. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on YouTube, please make sure you like and subscribe. And if you're listening on Spotify, Google or Amazon, please make sure you follow us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.